Welcome to the Traveling Professors. I'm Professor Bob. And I'm Professor Sherry. And together we are the, the Traveling, Traveling Professors. Professors. Today's show is about Carcassonne. This is going to be one of actually six shows on Carcassonne. This one will be the early history and an attacker's view of the fortification. I will be doing this one pretty much by myself. Uh, Sherry's not much on the military aspect. She's very good at it, but she doesn't enjoy it. So we'll get her back in when we do the tour of the old city and we take a tour of the of the bishop's palace, which actually is the hotel where we stayed, as well as the tour of the castle. So this fortification fighting materials will be done by myself. So I hope you enjoy that. Welcome to the city of Carcassonne. This is a view of the city from one side of the Ode River, which runs between what is now the town of Carcassonne and the magnificent fortress city at the top. Now, this has gone through quite a bit of change. We're going to look at the Roman period and the very early medieval period. What you see is the reconstruction of the fortification that was done in the 1800s, particularly between 1840 and 1860. This aerial shot just shows you how impressive the fortifications are here at Carcassonne. And what I'm going to do in this show is I'm going to walk around the outer edge of the first set of barriers, their first wall, and that is only 1,500 meters. Here's the tourist map of Carcassonne. We came in by train. The hotel had a person pick us up. And they drove us up to the edge of the wall, right near number 26, and we were there greeted by a hotel employee with a golf cart. And he drove us then through the two walls, past the Church of Saint Nazaire, and then where the X is, that is the hotel complex. And it's the old Bishop's Palace. It's a wonderful place to stay. And the interior of it is kind of like a maze in itself. Then you see the pink area, and that was the main road that they mapped out for us, so that if you were anywhere and you needed to get back to the hotel, if you found that, you could get back. You, you can notice that there's not a lot of chances, really, to get lost in this town. There's the main fort, Castle of Croncavilles. You see the two main gates, the Narbonne Gate, and where we're going to start is with what's left of the Roman Wall. Now, where the castle is, that used to be a, a Roman headquarters, a small Roman headquarters. And the inner wall on the side of it from the fortification to the gate is the Roman section. So that's where we're going to begin. Here is a schematic showing all of the walls at which time in which they were built. And we're going to be starting with the Gaelic Roman wall, which ended in the 3rd century, which is the red. Now, there was probably a section of it that ran from what is now the trade your tower all the way up towards the other red red line here, which I show with the arrow. That would have enclosed the uh, the outpost, which was very important for the Romans, and that would remain there for quite some time. And then after the Romans are gone, then the Saracens took over because this was part of Visigothic Spain at one point. And so once you get to the first half of the 12th century, you have the Viscounts of Carcassonne, the Troncavilles, and they added the purple. They began adding the fortress, and they probably in increased the uh, construction of the of the Roman wall and began adding an exterior wall. But the first main exterior wall, as you see, is not really added until Louis IX, St. Louis. And then the big secondary wall is added then in the later, last quarter of the 13th century by Philip III and Philip IV. And Philip III is Philip the Bold, because this once Louis IX takes over, it is a king's fortification. Therefore, it has significantly more value, and it is still Still sitting on the border between Spain and France. Now, at this point, people would say, how in the world would you defend this whole thing? Well, the estimates are that it would take about 1,323 men, and you'd have 200 in the castle, you would have 50 men at the Narbonne Gate, you'd have 20 men in every tower and Barbican, but you know, you're not going to be able to attack this this location from every side. When I do the walk of the uh, the attacker's view, you will see that you're very limited, and so you, you don't, you're not going to have to have people all the way around this. The first people we know of that inhabited this area, which is obviously a wonderful defensive position, is a, is a Celt tribe, the Volsces Texages, and they occupied it in pre-Roman times. In the second century BC, the Romans came in, put an observation post there, and then added some defensive works and had an average size castellium. This was the beginning of the town as well, and as, it, as, the, as the fort grew, so did the town. In 20 BC, a colony of Roman veterans were settled 
around the fort, kind of buck it up a little bit. However, after the fall of Rome, the Visigoths claimed Carcassonne and controlled the region from about 440 AD to 725 AD. It was a base of their operations, had an enormous headquarters, and they restored the Roman ramparts, so that gave it good defensive positions. And then, of course, after that time period, around 750, the Saracens came in and took it over. Now, you can access the Roman section of the wall and walk all the way around it uh, from the main castle. And so you go up into the castle, and then you have a flight of stairs and take a take a right, and there you are. You're out on the wall, and it's it's really excellent. It's easy to get by, You've got, and the view is absolutely spectacular. Now, it was a terribly windy day when we were up there, and I mean that wind howled. The only downside was they were doing reconstruction work and renovation on the other half of the city walls. So you, you could only do, really, the Roman section up to Narbonne Gate, and then you couldn't get down from there. You had to go all the way back and go back down the stairs. So here we are walking along one side of the wall, heading towards one of the, the Roman towers. You can always pick Roman towers. They're rectangular or semi-rectangular. And then when you walk into this one, it has all of these wonderful ports. You can see the roof and how they put it together. It may have had a second story on it uh, that they just haven't put in, but you have this nice tiled roof. And then on the inside, you can look out from the tower and you can see how you can, you can look at the village straight ahead, but look at the defensive position it offers. You can literally look one down one whole section of the wall. You can look down the other section of the wall, and then you can look straight out, see what's going on. If you notice in the uh, picture where we're looking straight out, and there's the round area. That's a section where you could have had your own catapult and maneuvered it however you wanted to. There are several of those on the lower level of defenses. So if you get through the lower level of defenses, then you get these people to deal with. However, where we are was originally the only defense that the Romans had, and it's pretty significant. And you can see how the town is down at the bottom of the hill, so to attack this is going to be quite tiring. Now, I know that you see that flat area there. Uh, that was sloped at one point. The, uh, when they built the, the second wall around it, they flattened that completely out to make it easier to move from one section or the other. Then if you continue on around, you end up at the, the very end and at this, this particular spot. What you see is where the Roman wall was and where the new, more fortified wall was installed. And it's believed it's at this particular point where the Roman wall would have then gone back towards what is now the uh, fortress. But you can see they, they saved as much money as they possibly could by reinforcing the Roman wall. And then they reached a point where, ah, you know, we got to put a bigger gate in here. We got to do some other stuff. So they went ahead and filled it on out. Okay, so let's pretend we are the attacker, and we're going to be dealing with this outer fortification. So here is the chart that I showed you when everything was constructed. Here is where I'm going to start. I'm going to start from this position, and we're going to head towards the Narbonne Gate. And then once we get to the Narbonne Gate, then we will go around to the other side until we go as far as it can possibly go, at which point that will be the lower level. Uh, the other side of the fortification that we're not going onto is, is incorporated into the fortress. Let the attacker's view begin. This shows two of the towers, the one with the blue top on it, that is the Tower of the Grand Brulas, and the other one is the Tower of Durlach. Now, all of the towers would not have had covers. The covers are added well after the uh, Renaissance period. You also see how the enemy got to Carcassonne by car. This is a big parking area. You'll see this parking area for a little ways. They removed parts of the of the most uh, so you could have some parking. But if you went past the front of the car, uh, you would begin to go downhill pretty quickly. So in order to attack this particular part, you would have to come up the hill and besiege it. Turning towards the direction that we would go to the main gate, we come to the Tower of Cremond. Now, this is an important tower. It, it juts out a little bit further. And of course, obviously, the tower, as you can see, the arrow slits on the side, which allow them to shoot down the sides of the walls. But this has one of the locations where you can actually enter. It has a, a post-turn opening. Uh, this is where our taxi drove up and met where we met a golf cart that then took us in to where where the hotel is. So this is one of the ways that you can go in and out of the fortification 
Ah, the sun is rising, and we only have 1,300 more meters to walk. The tower up ahead is the Tour de Cartier, and once you reach that and make a slight turn around it, you begin the view, another whole stretch of wall, and then one of the really major towers. It's called the Tower de Levade, and it has a little side tower. Now, it does not have, it looks like in this picture that it has a roof on it. It does, it does not. That's one of the other towers on the second level. But this at one time had a special organization of guards that, that would meet here. And it is one of the most important points along the way. And of course, when you get closer to it, you see the little side tower jutting out from the wall. You could put, you know, obviously you would put ladders up and try to climb up and over that, but you can imagine the kind of firepower that's going to be leveled at you. And you really can't really take that many men and attack the whole section of wall, which is what you would think. Now, I got relatively close, and this is a an attacker's view of up the Levad Tower. And of course, they can throw all kinds of stuff down on you besides shooting at you. So it is a very important area. Between the Levad Tower and the tower that you see in front of us, the Tour de Paye, is, is quite a distance. And then beyond it is the Entre Narbonnaise. This would have been the original entryway into the city, at least through this line of fortifications. What you see behind it is the later superstructure of the towers of Narbonne. When you get to the front, you see it is not a straight entrance. You never put a straight entrance in. You want to make little jogs in it, so it makes it harder for forces to come in. It is also drawbridged. It's actually drawbridged in two areas, one of which actually still works. You would have had portcullises. You would have had other things there to impede the advance of the infantry. It was really fun coming here at night and getting evening pictures, but I'll show you those in a, in a different setting. So one of the things that you can do here from the Entree Narbonnaise is this allows you to, again, look down the side. This is the view back towards the, the Tower of Pellier, and the other walk to the other side of the bridge, you would then see the view the other direction. And there you can see where the moat would have been. Uh, there is a parking lot above it, but they didn't take this one out and flatten it. So the rest of the, the trip, we will have uh, this actual moat size. So it is quite quite important and impressive. It makes it a little, a little harder to attack it. And then if you back away, this is the view from the front. You'll notice there's a very, very small vehicle going through that gate. They do allow vehicles to about nine o'clock in the morning, they are basically bringing supplies to the various buildings and restaurants. Now it's time for the local legend, story of Lady Carcass. And that is the little statue. It's not a very little statue, but that statue there is Lady Carcass. I'll get a closer view of her in a few minutes here. The story goes like this. Lady Carcass was the wife of the Saracen king Balak. Charlemagne besieged the city of Carcassonne for five years, trying to starve them out. In the end, the whole garrison died. But Lady Carcass made dummies and arranged them along the ramparts and then would spend her time shooting arrows into the enemy camp. She took her, her last pig and allowed it to eat her last grain. When the pig was full, she had it thrown from one of the towers when the Frankish troops attacked. When it hit, its belly split open, spilling out a large amount of undigested grain. Discouraged, Charlemagne fell for the ruse, and if they could throw a, a pig at them, and they still had food, it's a waste of time. So he broke the siege and left. Well, Lady Carcass sounded her trumpet to call Charlemagne back, but he didn't hear it. One of his aides did, and turned to him and said, Sire, Carcass te son. That means Carcass is calling you. And so this is the legend of where the name of the town comes from, Carcassonne. Now, there are other obvious explanations, but it's always nice to have a good story. As we say goodbye to Madame Carcass, we can look back, beautiful view of the towers, the Levade Tower and the others, the gate. If you turn just a little bit, you see this. This is the magnificent Narbonne Gate. It was built much later, and and in front of it, it looks like a giant tower. That is actually a barbican. This is a half moon shaped wall section where you would gather your forces so that if you wanted to sally out the gate, let's say they've attacked your fort, they've tried to get through the gates, they were unsuccessful, they're in the process of retreating, and you have amassed, let's say, 50 cavalry here. You can open the gates and ride them down, attack them, and then come back. Frequently, you would use these barbican.
barber can. And, and the, uh, the the fortress here at Carcassonne has three or four of them. So they're very, very important. This is a section of the city that you would never get in. If you're going to get in this direction, you've paid somebody, the, which is the oldest method of getting in the fortifications like this, bribing somebody to open the gate in the middle of the night. And then here we have the map showing where we're located and the direction that we are headed next. So we'll be looking at the probably the last five or six hundred meters of the exterior wall, but you will be able to see the Roman fortifications up at the top, because when we've been looking back over the fortifications front line, we've been seeing this later fortification that was added 50 years later. You'll be looking at the Roman fortifications up at the top. They were just simply reinforced. I am now standing on the top of the berm that makes the edge of the moat. You'll be able to see that as we walk around from this, this direction. The little tower that you see down below, that is the Tower of, of Bernard, and the big tower back behind it, part of that secondary wall, that is actually the treasure tower. Coming around the, the Tower of Berard, you see the gap where the moat is. And you see that the next tower down that direction is the Tour de Bazinet. So we walk a little further, and you can, if you look up at the secondary section, you can start seeing the Roman towers on the second second wall. Uh, once we get past the Tour de Bazinet, then the Tour de Notre Dame du Regali comes into view. This is a massive location, and it has an access port which allows troops to come charging out of there. It also has an a, a like it's, it's almost like a barbican, but it does have the ability to have a, a catapult up in there. Actually, all the towers on this end have a circular piece that you could put a small catapult in if you wanted to throw things at the enemy. And then turning that, we see that the Tour de Notre Dame, the Regali, is in the middle of this section of wall. And viewing down to the edge, you are seeing the Tower of Mortise, which is at the edge where you then turn to go to the back side of the city. After walking by the Tour de Mortis, you then end up right at the corner. And you can see above the fortifications with the Roman towers as well. When you get to the end, when you get to the Tour de Mortis and you turn that corner, what you basically have from this point to the next tower, which is the, the tower or the Tour de Glacier, you're now running into the back of the castle, the fortification inside all the walls. Now, at this point, there is no moat. If you look, you can see there's a trail, and you have to be careful here. Now, it had rained the night before. This is the view of what happens if you slip and go off to the side. You will literally just roll down the hill into the town. So at this point, it becomes a little precarious. Although it is still relatively wide, it'll continue to get more precarious as you get closer to the tower or the Tour de Glacier. So here, as we get a little closer, it's steeper. And then we reach the point where we're at the corner. And you notice that the path there's not much difference between getting to the wall and falling down. When you do reach that position and you turn the corner, you'll see one last tower. That is the Tower Port Rouge. It's a smaller tower. Uh, it's very much like just a little guard tower because if you're an attacker and you're at this particular point, there's you're, you're going almost perpendicular into this fortification position. And then once you turn that, it's going to be as far as we can go because around the corner from the Tour de Port Rouge, Rouge is the fortifications that lead down into the town, and that is known as the Barbican du Chateau. The back wall from the Tour de Port Rouge to the Barbican du Chateau. That's as far as we can go. So you go a little further down here, and again, you can see, see how steep it is. And I couldn't get a good picture of the Barbican from up here. But when, I, when we were in the castle, I was able to get some pictures. So here is a, a model showing where I'm standing. And you can see down below is the is the Barbican, and then a defensive wall that leads up to the, to the fort. And this is what it looks like today. There's the wall leading leading down to the town, and where the church is, that's where the Barbican was located. Now, that was destroyed in 1854 so that they could build the Church of St. Gymer there. That was built between 1854 and 1859. But the church itself sits right in the middle of this circular Barbican, which you could have had troops there protecting the village, and then if things fall apart, they simply retreat up the, uh, the wall into the main fortification up on top of the hill. So it's excellent. So as you can see, as we've walked around, 
how many different places there are for the troops to sally out and deal with an opponent. So we got one other place to go, and that is the back wall main gate, the odd gate. The way up to the Odd Gate starts near that modern church of St. Gymer. The path climbs up the west escarpment of the citadel and then right under another tower. Then it makes another right angle bend and turns north. At this point, it actually becomes a fortified corridor with the outer wall on the right and the battlement wall on the left. Against the inner wall, which is on the right, there are some buttresses. The space where one now finds yourself, if you get in through the gate and go up in the middle section, you would have been surrounded surrounded by battlements. It would have been a death trap to any attackers that got into that position. Hope you enjoyed our little journey around the exterior fortifications of Carcassonne. We have several other journeys to take on this beautiful fortress city. Sherry and I hope you enjoyed the tour. Please come by our YouTube channel at Bob Packett on YouTube. It should be History According to Bob, but it comes up as Bob Packett. That's the easiest way to get to it. And please subscribe and leave some comments. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please uh, subscribe, give a comment, and if you like history, please come by historyaccordingtobob.com website where I do six podcasts a week on different topics in history, and there's all sorts of CDs and other things that you can see. So thank you very much.